Users don't care about your system prompts or what model you're using under the hood. I mean, most of the time, they don't even want to think about AI. And that's why one of the biggest challenges of designing an AI product is figuring out the right level of abstraction. What features do you expose when the underlying model can do almost anything? The majority of the work that we've done over the last couple of years is trying to identify the right level of abstraction. And there's a real trade-off there because the more you abstract something, the less control you have over it. And so we needed to make a decision about how much complexity do we expose for the benefit of giving people control versus how simple do we want to make the product for the benefit of being easy to use and intuitive to use? That's Colin Dunn, the founder and designer of one of my favorite AI tools, Visual Electric. And a highlight from our conversation was hearing how a big part of designing a product like Visual Electric is helping users establish new mental models for AI. You don't actually need to understand what's happening technically. You just need to understand how it's going to affect the output. So we're, we're basically trying to create these mental models and these controls that will take this very complicated foreign technology and make it controllable and directable by creatives for their purposes. And this makes language, like the very specific words that you're using to describe affordances, incredibly important. So it's not just the sort of UI controls, but it's also what do you call this thing and how do you expose that? And so we came up with the creativity slider and the creativity slider is this really useful tool where you can basically tell the model how much noise do you want to add. Colin went on to use the creativity slider as an example of how they're constantly iterating on this balance between power and simplicity. There's a bunch of settings that you can expose and we expose the creativity slider, but we also expose something called a reference slider. Because when you're upscaling an image, you don't want the image to change. You presumably really like the image, but you just want it to be higher resolution with more detail. So you want to minimize the amount of changes that happen during the upscaling process. So if it's a photo of a person that you know, you probably want that slider to be at the highest level because you don't want that to change at all. Even small changes in somebody's face are highly recognizable. Um, but if it's a photo of a landscape, it's okay if it changes a little bit because it, it may actually be better if it changes because it can add more detail, it can hallucinate a little bit more and it will actually produce a better looking image. But that's an example of actually, I think, exposing too much complexity. I think we have both of those sliders in the product right now, and I don't think anybody understands what the difference is between those two things. Uh, so we're probably going to remove the reference slider and just have the creativity slider, and that will affect your reference level. But we're constantly iterating on, on the sort of abstraction layer. Here's the thing though, in order to iterate effectively on that abstraction layer, you have to understand the materials that you're working with. It's really hard to be in an AI team and like build a product and then steer the direction of it if you don't really understand it because things will just slip under you and you will not really understand what's happening. The kinds of things you can design and, and build uh, or even think of are directly related to the concepts that you understand, right? That's Mahin Sahail from Gen AI at Meta and Tyler Angert, who was the first design hire at Replit. Nowadays, Tyler is working on a new startup called Patina, so he's thinking a lot about this abstraction layer. The main design problem right now is just trying to figure out what the first core feature is that people actually care about and figuring out how to not expose too many of the internal details of like how it works to the user. Now this next clip from Tyler gets a little bit technical, so be warned, but more important than the specific details of what he's saying, I want you to get a sense of what is unlocked and just the different types of decisions that you're able to make as a designer when you understand the materials that you're working with. Right now when I'm designing like semantic search, the way that these models are designed, you know, if you want to be able to like type in anything and be like, what images are most related to this text, right? The, the models that you use to do that under the hood, just take in text and take in images and then spit out um, a big long list of numbers called an embedding that you can use to compare to figure out like what's most related to another. But most people stop there where it's like, oh, this is just for text search, right? If you really understand the material that you're working with and like the, the capabilities of these models, and you think a little bit more abstractly, you can do things like have like a live camera feed and use that to search my library. Like if I want all of the pictures of me smiling, I can just smile right into the camera and it'll grab the frames from that and then you take the embedding and then use that to search against the library. Or you can imagine I could upload a video as my search query and not that it would like just 
try to find the images most similar to the video. But like, imagine if you have this video loaded on screen and then you have like your photo library behind it. As you scrub through the frames of the video, it'll filter the most similar images in your library to whatever frame you're currently on. So you could like scrub through the video basically as a search mechanism, right? And like, that's a completely different search UX pattern that I don't think I've seen anywhere. Now, who knows if that type of interaction would ever take off, but that's beside the point. The reason I love that example is because Tyler was able to come up with a truly novel design pattern because he understood the basics of how the model works underneath the hood. It's the same for Colin at Visual Electric too. This is what's necessary if we're gonna push AI interaction patterns forward. I think the current world where many of the AI interfaces are super open-ended, right? Here's a text box, like you figure out what to do with it, are, are sort of misguided. They're like a temporary historical blip that we will get over soon, I'm hoping. Even if you give them like inline suggestions or like have a couple buttons, it's still not guiding them through a specific workflow to a specific goal. That's Maggie Appleton from last summer when she was leading design at Illicit. And I'll admit, a year ago, I was right there with her. It felt like a no-brainer that we were going to move past the prompt box as the primary entry point for AI. But there's a reason that it's only become more common in the last 10 months. It reminds me of when Amar Reshi from Eleven Labs was telling us about his conversation with Nate Parrott, who I interviewed back when he was the founding designer at the browser company. I was chatting with Nate Parrott the other day, and we were kind of debating back and forth. I was like, is the prompt box there's the text field and a generate button really the best we can do. And his opinion was actually that, you know, we're abstracting away a ton of complexity to just chatting. And that is actually like maybe the design move. Like maybe that is actually as simple as it needs to be. Real quick message and then we can jump back into it. One of my favorite parts of the recent episode with Smith and Diction was hearing about Mike's experience generating brand imagery using Visual Electric. I was already in Visual Electric because it looks like Figma. It feels like Figma, it operates like Figma, and that, to me, I was just like, I was comfortable. I felt like I was like, I can move around in here with confidence. I think that's exactly why I love the product so much too. I mean, sure, it's the most photorealistic image generator out there, but it's also so clearly built specifically for designers, and every single part of the UX is elite. So this is a reminder that you can get your first month for free using the code DIVECLUB. Just head to dive.club slash electric to get started. Look, you know how big of a Jitter fan I am, but their latest release is hands down the best one yet. Now, Jitter has an infinite canvas for animation design, and I mean, within 30 seconds of using it, I knew that this was always the way that it should be for motion design. It makes iteration 10 times easier, collaborating with team members makes way more sense, and you can scale content across formats using multiple artboards in a single file. Jitter is crazy. Like, this product is so incredibly good now, you gotta try it out. Just head to dive.club slash jitter to get started. That's J-I-T-T-E-R. Okay, now onto the episode. A bit later in the conversation, Amar shares about how they're building on top of the simplicity of chat. And this is where it starts to get really interesting in my opinion. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with these models. You can tweak all sorts of parameters. You can change the model type. And of course, each model has either faster inference or can control the stability more and all these things. But you don't really want people to have to worry about a lot of those things. And so even when I'm thinking about designing music, you know, you can you can add lyrics, you can change the genre, you might be able to uh, tweak just parts of the vibe of the track and the specific piece. But what is the most natural way to do that? And initially, I, I could have started with just text and you just describe every single aspect. And on, what that needs, though, or requires is that you need your user to need to know all those things to be able to craft a great prompt to get a good result, right? And I was starting to think about this more in terms of a almost a dynamic island kind of prompt box where if you need to change lyrics, it morphs into a prompt box that's basically best designed around like how lyrics need to be edited and the parts of lyrics. If you're about to choose genre, instead of you thinking about it, it populates with pills of all the genres that you actually need to like maybe want to play with or think about. And you could talk to it and maybe it'll actually point you and grow, like the UI will expand and grow based on that. So it's still expanding on that base idea of chatting and prompting, but teaching you along the way in a way that's very intuitive rather than tooltip here, click that, try to understand the thing. Yeah. 
And I think that's the thing that with designing with AI, you need to still capture the essence and the magic of it without putting the burden on the user. This is one of the topics that's most fascinating for me right now. So it's going to be a pretty big focus moving forward. Just finding the companies who are really innovating with AI and unlocking these new types of interaction patterns. So you'll definitely hear more from me on this topic, but that's all for now. I will see you next week. Thank you.